Alright, so this is our review for our study guide. This is going, uh, it's going to be almost identical to last week's quiz in the types of questions they're going to be, but they are going to be a little trickier, just a little bit. As an example, I'm starting off number one. It's probably one of the trickiest questions because it's almost contradictory to what I've said before. Uh, which is anything that goes inside of absolute value brackets has to come out positives. But what happens when something is outside of those brackets? Uh, if something is outside of those brackets, like let's say it was this one right here, a negative absolute value of e. Well, e is equal to negative 5, so when I replace that, here's what I have. Now it's true, anything inside those brackets will come out positive. So, uh, like if I just kind of take this, everything inside this circle becomes positive, but that negative symbol is on the outside of those brackets. It doesn't just go away. So what I end up doing is keeping that number as a negative. Uh, I know that that's tricky, but remember I said that that dolphin and anchor question has shown up on an EOG before? This exact question hasn't come up on the EOG, but putting a negative outside of absolute value brackets, that has come up every single year. Uh, so that's why I'm putting it on here. I know it's tricky, but it is fair game for the end of year test. And it's going to be fair game on, tom yeah, on tomorrow's test. So, for this problem, keeping in mind that this is still going to be a negative 5, this says that the absolute value of g, which would be a positive 3, is going to be less than negative 5. And no, it's not less than negative 5. So, there were not two correct answers for this one. This one was false. Uh, f is less than g? No. The absolute value of, neg of f would be positive 4, which should be more. Uh, absolute value of e, which would be 5, is greater than negative f. So this is another tricky part, which is if I make this a negative, it's now negative negative f. Guess what? That makes it a positive 4. If I take negative negative 4, that becomes positive 4. So, no, this one won't work. This one, well, actually, no, this one would be the correct answer. I almost just said it wrong. This one would have been the correct answer because, and this is, this is what I mean, it's so tricky that even I get tongue twisted on it. For this problem, the absolute value of E, absolute value of negative 5, would come out to be positive 5. Even if I took this number and made it positive, it's still either going to be positive or negative 4. So frankly, all of that extra mental gymnastics I just did was unnecessary. It's going to come out to be either positive or negative 4, both of which are still less than 5. So, this is the only correct answer for this one. For number 2... In this number line, uh, what represents the opposite of letter E? Okay, the opposite of letter E is going to be positive 2. That's how number 2 was supposed to work. For number 3, what is the temperature? Yes, uh, 2. The answer to this one is actually going to be negative 4. The way you can tell is look at how many tick marks there are again. We've got 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 tick marks later and we're already at negative 10. They're counting by 2's again. So 0, negative 2, negative 4. That's where we're at for this problem. Let's go ahead and go to the next one. This problem is mostly quick problems with a couple of tricky ones. For number four, which point is located at negative six and two fifths? So negative six and two fifths. Well, if this was a positive six and two fifths, 
it would belong between positive 6 and positive 7. This is negative 6 and 2 fifths. It belongs somewhere between negative 6 and negative 7. So automatically, those two are out. It can't be them. Now, it says 2 fifths. They, they weren't being tricky here. It's 2 fifths, but remember, we need to count away from where 0 would be. We need to count going towards the next number. So we start at negative 6, and we go 1 fifth, 2 fifths. Because if I kept going, I'd be at 3 fifths, 4 fifths, and then the next number. But we don't want the next number. We just want 2 fifths, which would be x. If you counted from the left instead, if you counted from set negative 7, you would have thought that it was w. And if you didn't realize that you it has to be between negative 6 and negative 7, you would have picked y or z. For number 5, which integer represents a decrease of 8 degrees? Decrease, that's going down. That's negative 8. For number 6, let's see. He compared the low temperature for 4 days, and it's asking which day is the coldest. Well, let's write them out. On Monday, it was negative 7.30. Tuesday, it was negative 7.42. Well, already, 7.42 down, that's further down, or further away, than 7.3. Uh, on Wednesday, uh, 7.38, again, 7.42 is further down. And then Thursday, it is 7... Point forty going down. Well, looks like Tuesday's it. Just kind of picture, if they're all negatives, you can just picture them all as their positive versions. That works just fine. But the bottom line is we're counting how far away from zero on the thermostat, how far down would this be. And Tuesday would be the furthest down. For number seven, which pair represents opposite numbers? So you're just looking for positive and negative version. And that's it. Negative and positive five. Those are opposites. Where is M located? Hmm. Well, my answer choices all are in fourths. So I'm guessing this was counting by fourths. So if I started from zero, zero negative one-fourth, negative two-fourths, negative three-fourths, negative four-fourths, which is one whole. So negative one, negative one, and one-fourth. That's where M was supposed to be located, was negative one and one-fourth. Again, start counting from zero. Uh, for number nine, which point has an absolute value of two-thirds? So we either have a positive or a negative here. It's not t, though, because if I count here, 0, 1 third, 2 thirds, <clears throat> there is nothing at positive 2 thirds. So I have to look at the negatives. 0, negative 1 third, negative 2 thirds. The absolute value of negative 2 thirds would be 2 thirds. So for number 9, we get s. All right, almost done here. Which statement describes the relationship between negative 5 and 3 on a number line? Well, let's see. Negative 5 is 5 units away from 3. No. If you have a number line with you, and you should, um, but no. Negative 5 is not 5 units away from 3. It's 5 units away from 0. Uh, 3 is 3 units away from 5, or negative 5. Still no. Negative uh, 5 is 2 units closer to 0 than 3. Okay, well let's think about that. If I have a number line with me, and I'm going to pause this and get a number line. Alright, there we go. I have my number line. If I count, here's negative 5, and here is positive 3. So the question was saying, I think it said negative 5 
is two units closer to zero than three. No, we can see that it's kind of the opposite. Three is three units away from zero, but negative five is five units away from zero. So if answer choice D says that, it does. Three is two units closer to negative five, uh, closer to zero than negative five. For number 11, which pair of numbers correctly represents the absolute values of negative two and six? Well, it's absolute value. So whatever they are, it's now gonna be positive two and positive six. Anything inside those brackets becomes positive. For number 12, which number shows the point at negative 0 0.7? So, negative 0 0.7, we know it has to be between 0 and negative 1. Okay, now the question is, is it going to be closer to the 0, or should it be closer to negative 1? The answer is, it should be closer to negative 1. 0 needs to be closer to neg uh, zero, negative 0 0.7 has to be closer to negative 1 because negative 0 0.5 would be right smack dab in the middle. And if I were to count this out and if I wanted to draw like 10 tick marks, that is about where negative 0 0.7 should be on this number line. For number 13, uh, which statement is true about these points? T is more than W. No. T is to the left. It's not more than anything. V is more than Z. Again, no. V is to the left. It's less. Uh, y is less than X. Y is less than X. No. Y is to the right, so Y is more than X. Uh, v is let or sorry x is less than z yep x is to the left therefore it is less than z and last but not least putting fractions in order from least to greatest now you have a few options for this one you could go ahead and start putting these in order keeping a couple things in mind or uh, if you are super not sure you would have to change all of these by finding the least common denominator between them all. Either way, you know that these two fractions should be first. Unfortunately for us, our answer choices represent that. So, I'm going to tell you right now, the correct answer for this problem would end up being, I believe it is this one, just by eyeballing it. Because I know uh, one half and versus four sixths. If I wanted to change this to this and compare just those two, I know that they have to be first. But one half, the least common denominator between them would be six. So four six stays exactly the same. But one half, multiply the bottom by three, multiply the top by three. I'm comparing three six versus four six. So we know it's not these two now. Okay, one half has to come first. All that's left now is to compare one and one third and one and four six. But I could just ignore the whole number because I know that number is not going to go anywhere. That number is not changing. We're looking at the fractions. What is the least common denominator between eight and three? If I counted by eight, 8, 16, 24, and I counted by 3's, 24 would be the smallest number they both have in common. So I have to change 4 eighths into 24 fourths, and I have to change 1 third into 24 fourths. Okay, so if I'm looking at this right, I have to do 8 times 3 to get 24 which means I have to multiply the other number by 3. That gives me 12. I multiply this by 8, which means I have to multiply this by 8. Well, if I do that, I get 8. Which of them was bigger? The 8s. 
the eights was bigger. So this one should be dead last, which is exactly what C represents. You don't have to find the common denominator for all four of them, although spoiler, if you did, it's 24. Reason you don't have to do it for all of them all at once is because these two numbers don't have a whole number. They're just a fraction. They're less than one. So you know that already those two numbers have to be first, so you can break the problem down into two simpler parts. And that's going to be it for the study guide. Let me check and make sure there were no typos, as there so often are. No, there were not. See? Number one, that is the answer. All right, and that's it. Hopefully this helps. I mean, it's not too much different than last Friday's quiz. Also, in case I forgot to post it anywhere, uh, this quiz and the last quiz, since they test the same exact standards, uh, I will be only keeping the highest grade of either this quiz or your last quiz. Uh, so if, for example, last quiz you didn't do so well uh, and haven't done a retest yet, if you do better on this one, I will keep only this grade. Or let's say you took the last quiz you didn't do so well you took a retest and made like a hundred but I only gave you an 80 because I can only give a maximum of an 80 for a retest if you score 100 on your first attempt for this quiz yeah that 80 percent maximum goes away because this is a whole nother quiz so if you've been looking for a retest but wanted to get more than an 80 this is your chance tomorrow and all I have to say is make sure you've got like a number line ready to go, draw a few of them, and you should be in good shape.